Good morning, OCM. That was so sad. Good morning, OCM. <laughs> um, as we rise, can you greet each other on the way up? And if you are at the edge, make your way to the middle to let the ushers give them an easier time. Great. Um, I'm going to start us with a word of prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this morning. Thank you for who you are and what you've done in our lives. I'm thanking you for bringing us here, and we just pray that you prepare our hearts and minds for worship, prepare our ears, our hands, um, and our voices um, to glorify your name, Lord. So we just pray that you be with us this Sunday morning um, as we worship you and come to worship you as, a, as one body. In Jesus' name, amen.
this morning. Look for somebody you don't know. Welcome them. I don't know if you're into handshaking yet. You can still do the fist thing or wave. I will say this morning, I will say this morning that the youth are very impressive because at 10 o'clock this section was full and this section was empty. When did you guys come in here? I didn't see you come in. So my hat's off to the youth. You did a great job. I appreciate it. Great to be here today. Let's spend some time praying. I have a few things that, that we're going to put up on the screen to pray for. And as we are praying together, uh, we're going to start with praise. And then we're going to spend a little time of repentance. So, but I want you to do that silently. I want you to spend a moment for just a few seconds thinking about what has God shown me or done for me this week, and then I'm going to 
ask you to spend some time confessing, and then we'll continue on the prayer together. So everybody, let's pray together. Ponder for a moment what God has done for you this past week. And now come before God and say, Lord, this is where I've fallen short. I ask for your forgiveness. Father, I thank you this week you have given great wisdom and guidance in our lives where we have made challenges and you are the God who has the answers. I thank you for that, Lord. I come before you recognizing where I have fallen short, and I have. There have been times of, of doubt this week, wondering what is going to happen next and then realizing that I just simply need to come back and say, Lord, it's all about you. I just praise you, and I'm going to follow you. Father God, we want to pray today for our dear friends, Stanley, Michelle, and Ace. And Lord God, we pray for his, Ace's continued growth and strength. And we pray for Stanley and Michelle that they will continue to have their trust in you as they walk forward. Father God, we want to pray for Aline Ho today. As she's gone through surgery, we pray for her recovery. We pray that her husband be able to encourage her and take care of her. Father God, we want to pray for Alfred Grieg, the husband of Yash. Lord, we thank you so much for her and her, her love for you. And she has this deep sense of praying for her husband and she's, he's going through this difficult illness now. We pray for him today. Father God, we want to pray today for the final Sunday of the JFF ministry. We thank you, God, for how you've used that in so many ways. And I pray, God, that through this ministry that some folks will come to know you as Savior. Through this ministry, some, maybe some of our, our Christian brothers and sisters will come back and say, you know, I need to get more focused on my, my walk with Christ. I thank you, Lord, that we've been able to gather and have this. Father God, I want to pray for our church leaders today. I pray, God, you'll continue to give them wisdom as they have a, many challenges ahead of them, many decisions to make. Lord God, don't let them make decisions without you. Don't let them make decisions without prayer. Don't let, make them, let them make decisions by their own wisdom. Father God, I want to pray for those in our congregation today who are gathered here together in this service who may not know you as Savior, whether they're here or on the overflow on the first floor or they're at home. I pray, God, that today will be their day of salvation, that we can share with them what it means to experience the glory of God in our daily lives. I pray, God, that today will be their day of salvation. I pray all this believing in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Jeff is going to come share with us the Advent reading today. Um, different season, sorry. <laughs> Good morning. So I am not Debbie. She is far better looking than me. I agree. <laughs> <clears throat> During Lent, one way that we prepare to celebrate Easter is by adding something that helps us to be more attentive to God. So on Sundays, we are bringing to you a series of guided reflections through the arts. Today, we are looking at a painting by Lang Shuning. He painted this sometime between 1723 and 1735. Lang was Italian, and his Italian name was Castiglione. <clears throat> he was sent as a Jesuit Christian missionary to China when he was 27 years old to serve as artist and pastor. The founder of the Jesuit order, St. Ignatius, taught Go and seek God in all things. This approach is seen in Long's art and pastoral work. Long became a good friend to the emperor who admired his goodness and his painting skills. Long is the first painter to successfully integrate Western art techniques such as depth, perspective, and shadow with traditional Chinese composition, framing, and vision. In this way, Long developed a new style of painting. 
Similarly, his approach to bringing the message of God's love to China was to learn Chinese culture and philosophy and discern where God had already been working to prepare people's hearts to receive Christ. Chinese paintings are frequently intended to guide the viewer to contemplate nature and to gain spiritual understanding. Long's painting certainly makes us mindful of nature. Look at the flowers. If you close your eyes, maybe you can almost smell these flowers and hear the birds. And the way this is framed, it says nothing else matters. You've just been lucky enough to walk into an eternal spring. So as we take a closer look, Long's painting invites the Christian viewer into prayer. As you look at the freshness of the blossoms, the different kinds of flowers, the abundant leaves overtaking the dead branch, you gain a sense of the overflow of God's generosity in nature. It's not just one flower and one leaf, it's an abundance from God. Then this painter includes birds, harbingers of spring. Today is the first day of spring. And where there are birds, there are birdlings. Abundance and more to come. Just like God declared at creation, this is good. And so our prayers turn into praise and thanksgiving to God. The title of this series, Immortal Blossoms in an Eternal Spring, point to the promise that Jesus offers. Jesus offers an eternal spring where there will be no death, no darkness, and no pain. In his death and resurrection, Jesus initiates a new life for us. We walk in fellowship with God and we are on the trajectory towards eternal life and God's kingdom. When Jesus prays, your will be done, he is not only praying that he must suffer and die, Jesus is praying for God's kingdom to come. He is praying that God make true his plan and his promise of resurrection and new life for Jesus and for us. to do the pastoral. Good morning. Um, today's scripture reading passage comes from Exodus chapter 33, verses 12 to 23. Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will, you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I'll give you rest. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And then the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked, because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Then Moses said, Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, You cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, There is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back. But my face must not be seen. May God bless the reading and hearing of his word. Thank you, Jeff and Jessica. I appreciate that. You were talking about Debbie Fung. I thought you meant my wife, Debbie. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, I'm trying. No, I'm looking forward to 
what God is starting to give, you know, starting us again to have the, uh, the, the CE classes. You know, next Sunday, Barnabas is going to start teaching a class called Communing, Communicating the Gospel Every Time. Now, there's an exclamation point after time, which means excitement, okay? So it's Communicating the Gospel Every Time. That'll be, that'll be in, the, in 701 after service. Uh, I'm starting the Leviticus class, started last week. Um, I will explain more later, but I won't be able to do it today. Uh, now you'll understand more later. Um, but we will start, we'll keep going in, in the first two weeks of April. Uh, we'll continue on with, uh, with that class. And then next week, week from Tuesday, I'll be starting the class I mentioned called the End Times, and I'll send out more information on that. So we've got, we got to come together and do these things. Also, I want to remind, remind Covenant that I noticed that not many of you have signed up for the two activities for the Covenant Ladies and Men. Okay, more ladies have signed up for exercise than the men, okay, which is a bad thing. Okay, so guys, come on, let's, let's, let's get on. So sign up for the, for the covenant activities that are coming up at the end of March. Uh, we want to get ready for that and, um, and as we participate. The other thing I want to mention is April 1st, we, last Sunday we had a great time of prayer. I don't know who all was there, but we had a great time of prayer for those who were there. On April 1st, on Saturday, April 1st, we're going to have a time of fast and pray um, uh, coming up on, in, in April. And I want to encourage you all to start thinking about participating with that because it's, it's, I think it's a very, very important for us to come together as a church. We saw that last, last Sunday. And I think we'll continue to see that as we come together and pray for God to guide us in the things that we're facing as a spiritual community. So I want to encourage you to put that on your calendar as we consider coming together and talking with God together. See, talking with God is, is really is, is such a vital part of our lives that so many of us struggle with. And when we come together and pray as a spiritual community, it helps us to be able to do that together when we pray together. You know, Moses, we're going to look at a passage here. Moses was, was praying. And Moses was coming before God in the, in the tent of meeting because he had some things he wanted to, to talk to God about. But what's, what's really interesting is this, about this particular communication that Moses had with God is that things were going a little bit better. You know, we, got, we had the golden calf situation just previous to that. And it was not good. The people were rejecting, and the people were causing, you know, this, this they're turning away from God, and there was, there was accountability, there was, there was punishment, there needed to be repentance, and the people did repent, they came before God, and, and they, they, came back to, they came back and followed Him. We see that after that golden calf experience, and there's a section called the tent of meeting, some people title it, but basically it's talking about how Moses would have this communication with God, but the people were very into it. The people were interested. It said that when he would, he would go in there, that the, the uh, cl uh, um, pillar cloud would come over the tent of meeting, and then, and then people would come out, and they would, they would start worshiping God and say, okay, we, we, we need to do this. We, we've been through some tough times. We've made some mistakes. We've, we've gone down a bad road, and we want, to, we want to come back and follow in a better way. So you think that Moses, in this context, would say, you know what, things are doing pretty good. We've got a pretty thing, good thing going here. People are coming back. We've gone through the, the tough times. But he wasn't satisfied. He wanted more. He wanted more for himself, and he wanted more for his spiritual community. And I can, I can relate to that. I definitely want more for myself, but I also definitely want more for my spiritual community here. And we're going to start a little bit earlier than what Jessica started reading there, because Jessica, I don't want to make you read the whole thing, so I gave you a little shorter part. Um, and and she did a great job, right? Right? I don't hear any response, okay? Come on. <laughs> You're right, Lauren. They're a little bit sleepy this morning, aren't they? Yeah, okay. It's daylight savings time. That's what it is. Okay, you are all lose us that hour of sleep. Well, well, we'll wake you up now. So Moses... In, chapter, in, in uh, chapter 33, verse 12, it says, Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. And Moses here, he's, they've come off all these, these great experiences. Things are, seem to be going in the right direction, but yet he's still coming before God, and he's saying, listen, but I need more. I need you to show me something more. I need something for myself, and I need something for the people. 
I need to know who, what is your plan? He says, I need to know you. I need to know you. And this, this first point we're going to see here is, is the knowledge of God. Moses wanted to, to have a sense of this. And when I say knowledge of God, I'm not just talking about, you know, knowing more of the Bible. We always talk about, okay, study the Bible and know more of the Bible. I'm, that's important. That's, that's a vital, actually. That's why we have our CE classes. But this knowledge of God, knowledge of just information is not sufficient. When I was preparing for this Leviticus class, I, I found that there's a lot of books on Leviticus, and, and I would say a lot of, most of them are very boring, okay? Because they go into all these details and things, and they analyze these things. And I read this stuff, and, I, and it's helpful. It's helpful for me to understand the context of the, of the passage. But at the end of it, I'm looking at this, I'm saying, but what does this mean to my life today? How does this affect me? How does this help me to be a Christian? How does it help me go to school? How does it help me to work? How does it help me to, to, to talk to people? And so that, that aspect of understanding details of Scripture, yes, is vital and important. That's why we're doing these classes. But, but Moses wanted this knowledge of God, which was, God, what are you doing? What are you thinking? How is this affecting my life? Who's going to be going with me? Who can I rely upon? God, I want to know more about who you are and what you're thinking in your life, in my life. He had to know more, and he wanted greater things. He wanted to have a greater sense of God. You see, folks, some people are just satisfied with the daily existence. A lot of you are. A lot of you are sitting here saying, I'm satisfied. I do my church thing, and then I go back and I do my work thing. I got my friends thing. I got my things all in order. And they're satisfied just existing. But Moses wasn't. He says, I got to know you more. I got to see the bigger picture. I got to see what you're doing. I got to see how I fit into this. I want to know what my purpose is. And folks, you can know. And, what's my, and, and because God is there for us, and no, Moses is saying, I got to know more. And this is the guy who was leading this, this whole group of people. He wanted to know more. I was listening to a sermon by Martin Lloyd-Jones. And as I was listening to him, he, he actually takes this passage and he talks about revival and the, and the idea of what it takes for revival to come. He says, this, he says, this is a roadmap to revival. He says, because revival doesn't mean that you don't have a decent thing going on. It doesn't mean you have a, doesn't have a, don't have a church. It doesn't mean you don't have worship. It doesn't mean you don't have you know, people studying the Bible. He says, all those things are happening. You got people got jobs or they're comfortable. He said, but revival is when people are not satisfied. They want to know more. They got to know more. What is this life with God? And how does it change my existence? How does it give me a greater purpose and understanding of life? Martin Lloyd Jones, in the sermon, he says, We are in the day of small things, my friends. These are the days of small things, and there are big things. And I'm talking about the longing for bigger things. Is there a longing in your heart for something? bigger because that's what's going to lead to revival in yourself and our church and our community and what martin lloyd jones is saying is that so many christians are satisfied with the small but moses wasn't moses wanted to know more he wanted to understand more. It says Romans chapter 10, 17. It says, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. And there's this aspect of studying the word. We understand the Old, the Old Testament talks about you know, the salvation and, and points to the gospel. But the, the, the idea here is that as we understand Scripture, we need to understand Christ and understand Him more. What did He do? How did He live? You see, my friends, as we study Scripture... All scripture that we study points to the gospel, the good news. The good news that God has for us. Is there a yearning in our hearts to know more? Psalm 103, verse 7 8 says, He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious and slow to anger. God granted we will see at god granted this to moses as you look at his life even though moses had his difficulties he had his failures he granted this to moses and moses had this sense of, of god so that even though he couldn't enter the promised land he knew his god he had a knowledge of his god 
I asked you to do a little homework this week on the Asbury Revival. I don't know if you did or not. And some people got confused because there's actually one a number of years ago. I'm talking about the one last month uh, when people got together. And, and there's two questions that I think you can ask about this Asbury Revival. If you, if you read about it, it's a time when a bunch of people got together. Basically, a guy was preaching in the chapel service. And, and as he was preaching in the chapel service, uh, the, the, you know, the students were moved. And, and they were just like, we got to know more. And they started praying together. And then more came and more came. And all of a sudden, 24 hours a day, people were coming to that chapel. They were singing. They were praising. They were praying together. And nobody could figure it out. It didn't make sense to them. But what happened? And they talked, and, and they talked to the guy who did the actual sermon. And, they, and as he said, hey, listen, you know, what was it you preached? He says, honestly, he says, I thought it was a really bad sermon. <laughs> he said, I didn't think it was that good. I feel that way all the time. He said, it was a bad sermon. Point is, is that God, the people were yearning for something more. And through the word of God hearing it, it clicked with them. And they came together and they're praying and they're seeking God. And it's spread to other places. It's, but it comes from us having the sense of there's got to be something more in our lives. There's got to be something more in our lives. That's why I asked you to take a look at that sermon. Verse 14 says, The Lord replied, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. And, and God's response is powerful because he's saying, Moses, I'm with you. And because I am with you, you will have rest. You will be content. You will have a fullness simply because I am with you. I will give you rest. I will give you rest. And I, I was, I, you know, some of you read the, a, a preacher called John Piper, and, and he, has, he has this interesting take on, on what it means to be a, 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 you know, a glorify God in our lives. Because sometimes people say to me, you know, that's kind of selfish. God wants me to glorify him. You know, hey, God, I glorify you, you know. And, and it's like, but that's not, that's not the point at all. Glorifying God is us being at rest. God is glorified when we experience his rest in our lives, his contentment. When we see life as he wants us to live it, not as we are living it, but as he wants us to live it, and as we experience God, as we recognize that, as we acknowledge it, as we give, acknowledge that to, to, to the world, that God is the one that is with me, then he is glorified by that. John Piper said, he calls this Christian hedonism, we'll talk about that word later. He says, teaches that every person, all of us, should seek with all our might to maximize the intensity and duration of our enjoyment of God above all things because God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. And what he's saying is very basically is that we, when we are satisfied in God, God is glorified. That's what God wants for us. He didn't create us so that he could have this, this ego trip. He didn't create us and put us on this earth so that he could have somebody keep him company. He created us because he's creative. It's a beautiful thing for us. He wants us to enjoy this life that he's given to us. He doesn't want us to be uh, unhappy with life. It doesn't mean we're not going to have problems. He wants us to go through those problems realizing what he's doing in our lives. And as we realize that, as we acknowledge that, then he is truly glorified. Piper always uses 1 Corinthians 10, 31, which says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Everything that we do in our lives, as we're eating, as we're drinking, as we're playing JFF, as we're coming and sitting in service, we see how do we do that in the way that God created us to do that. You see, God did not create us to be gluttons. Okay, he, he created us to eat food and enjoy it, but not excessive. He says, use this food. He didn't create uh, you know, wine for us to, to go, go excessive and lose control. No, he, but he, he, it is something that is part of his creation that we can do. And as we enjoy it, what he's given to us in the way that he created us to enjoy it. Sexual relationships. God created sexual relationships. But he didn't create them so that they could become just for me and self-centered. But he said that enjoyment is there, and it can be there if we do it in the way that he created us to enjoy and do those things. God is glorified when we truly are content in what he's given to us. 
recognizing that there's difficulties and challenges, but so many times we seek to, 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 to find our own contentment without God. We're saying, I don't want to do it the way God has shown me I should live my life. But God is saying, I am with you, and I will give you rest. If you keep seeking to understand, God, why did you create me? Why did you put me here? What are my gifts and abilities? How can I best live in this world? What can I do for you? And I put aside all that other stuff that people put upon me that they say well, is going to somehow make me happy. Christ said in John 17, 4, I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Christ was, came here for a purpose as he gave his life for us. But his very life as he lived on this earth, as he did what he was called to do, his very life glorified God simply because it, his purposes were fulfilled. And what Christ did affected so many. God was glorified by his, the life of Christ. Simply by him appreciating and living and enjoying. You think Christ was depressed through his life? You think Christ was saying, I hate being here. These 12 apostles are real jerks. I don't want to be with them. You know, is that what he was saying? Christ thrived on his relationships. He thrived on what he was called to do. He didn't want to suffer, but he knew that his suffering would lead to something. And we thrive on our relationships. We thrive on what God has given us to do. We don't want to suffer, but we know that if we do go through hard times, and some of you have gone through very difficult times. I know. Some of you are going through difficult times right now. I know. And that's why we need this spiritual community to come around you, to encourage you, to help you, to pray for you, to study Scripture with you. You're not alone. And as we do that, God is glorified because that is what He created us to be and to do. You want to glorify God? Enjoy life. When I say enjoy life, I don't mean go out there and, and say, okay, well, I'm going to enjoy life because I'm going to go out there and be excessive and do what the rest of the world does. No, enjoy life in the way God says that you truly can enjoy life, where you won't wake up depressed. You won't wake up alone. You won't wake up feeling selfish. You won't wake up feeling like you, you've not done anything useful. I enjoy the life that God has given to me because of all of you. Because of all of you. The Israelites had trouble with this because they, were, they, had, they had been blessed. They had been given so much. It says in Ezekiel chapter 16, he says, but you trusted in your beauty and used your fame to become a prostitute. You lavished your favors on anyone who passed by and your beauty became, became his, but you trusted in your beauty and used your fame to become a prostitute. What he's saying there is that Israel, you had so much and you've been blessed with so much and yet you still turn away from God. The knowledge of God in our daily existence is what we yearn for. We want more. Then we see, starting in verse 15, we're going to talk about the holiness of God. We're going to talk about the holiness of God in our lives. It says in verse 15, it says, Then Moses said to him, If, you're, if, you're, <coughs> excuse me, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. Now, God just said his presence is going to be with them, but, this is his, but Moses is saying he's going on from there. Moses, he's, Moses always wants more, and it's great. He says, he says, Moses, in your presence, if your presence does not, he said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us for, up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And Moses is saying that in the holiness of God, he's recognized that we are different. And he says when God's people have the presence of God with them, they are different. You can see that they are unique. They're not like something else. And, and the Israelites had trouble with that. They had trouble understanding that. You know, as we see in Leviticus chapter 10 where, where uh, um, the sons of Aaron, they had trouble with that. They wanted to... They wanted to they were supposed to be the, the priests and they were taking things from themselves and, and they weren't living in, in the knowledge of God. And it says in chapter 10, verse 3, uh, that Moses said, said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke of when he said, among those who approach me, I, uh, I will be proved holy. In the sight of all the people, I'll be honored. In other words, those who are coming to lead in the worship, if they were truly following his, his knowledge, if they're truly seeking to glorify him, then, God, then the holiness of God would be so apparent 
because it's distinct, it's different, and we become distinct or different. Piper said that the two things, two things that, that cause us to, to go away from really glorifying God are pain and pleasure. When we have pain in life, we try to find ways to avoid the pain, or we want to seek pleasure, and we don't think that God's going to give us that pleasure. But it's something powerful that we need to have in our lives as we are seeking to be unique. And, and one thing that, that we, we think about is, is, as a church, are we distinct? Do people see us as distinct? And this is what Moses is talking about. He says, if your presence is not with us, people will not look at us and say, they are God followers. There's lots of churches in the U.S. today. There's a lot of churches in the world today. But are, there, are all these churches truly experiencing the presence of God? My friends that oversee Chinese mission, are we truly experiencing the presence of God that said, when somebody walks in there saying, there's something about these people. They have a presence that not everyone has. They're not just some organization. They're not just a hierarchy of, of people. They have something that I want to have and be a part of. It starts with me yearning for something more. It starts with you yearning for something more. This presence of God, this enjoyment of God in every aspect of my life. And we had that conversation together. I'm not going to put it up on the screen, Gordon, but in 1 Timothy 6, verses 17 and 19, Paul is telling people, those who are wealthy, he says, use your wealth in a ways that will, that will encourage other people. Don't just do things for yourself. There's nothing wrong with being rich. Just don't keep it for yourself. He says, use it for, for my glory and for helping others and, and, and building the community. He says, it's okay to be rich, but don't do it at the expense of someone else. You see, this is something that we, we talk about holiness. We are distinct. We live different. We're not saying we're going to follow the ball of this world. We're not going to look at, at, is it called TikTok? TikTok. TikTok. And, and you know how everybody has to follow that dance stuff and everything? Somebody tried to get me to do that. Can you imagine me doing TikTok and, you know, I don't know. And, you know, and, and it, that's what the world does. It says, here's something that's cool. Follow this. Here's something that's neat. Follow this. Here's the way to live life. Follow this. And it leads away from God. And God's people are distinct. We are holy. God is holy. And the way that when he has his presence within us, we will be distinct because we will live different in our lives. What is the difference, the holiness? It's not that we look different by our appearance or the things that we choose to do or not do. We enjoy God as we enjoy the life that he has given to us. We do not give up things to enjoy God. We do not give up things to enjoy God. We experience things to enjoy God. Do I experience God more through my experiences or has, become, has God become more of a shadow? And in the experience of your life, are you experiencing God? Do you sense his presence? Do you see the joy of following the way he would have us to live? Or has it become more of a shadow in your life? And that's something we've got to come back and come together and say, we've got to do something about this together. Jesus had an earthly body weighed down by sinful desires. I care for, I care for my body, but I do not worship my body. This body will pass and I will have a new body just as Christ has a new body that is not weighed down by sinfulness. And the last point that we're going to see is the glory of God. The glory of God. And, what, and when Moses said to God, in what Jessica just read, she said, Moses said, show me your glory. And the Lord says, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face. No one may see, uh, see me and live. And what, what's happening here is that there's a sense of this glory of wanting to see more of God, wanting to understand him more because God's glory is this all-encompassing of who he is. As we look into his holiness, we see his glory, we see who God is and how he affects every aspect of our lives. Isaiah 6, 3 says, um, and they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. The whole earth is full of his glory. And it's, a, it's an interesting passage there because as, as they were coming together, Isaiah was struck by God and his awesomeness and who he was and how he was so 
lacking in his life. He says in verse 5, Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord God Almighty. And as he was understanding, looking at his holiness and, the, and how God was had, without sin, and he looked at his own sinfulness, he, had, he had also had a realization of this glory of God, of how God affects every aspect of our lives. And the whole earth says the whole earth is full of his glory. God is impacting this world today. We just need to get on board and be a part of it. Do we want to be a part of what God is doing today? There's a man named Johann Albrecht Bengel who wrote, For holiness is hidden glory, and glory is holiness shining forth. Now, ponder that a second. It took me about three weeks to really think about this phrase. For holiness is hidden glory, and glory is holiness shining forth. And what he, he's saying here is that as we experience this holiness of life, it's, we, we understand that, that it's, this glory of God is there because of God's holiness. But then when we talk about the glory is this holiness, this separation, this uniqueness, this lack of sin that shines forth throughout the world. It's, it's connected. It's connected. See, the gospel is, is full of the glory of God, the glory of the gospel the gospel of glory is that we can experience God and the life that he has for us because of what salvation we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. In the last few verses, he says, Then the Lord said, There is a place near me where you may stand on a rock when my, when my glory passes by, and I will put you in a cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand. And if I have passed by, then I will remove my hand, and you will see the ba- my my back, but not my face, because the glory of God, God's fullness is just beyond us. But I want to know more. We know such little, but the more we understand of God, the more powerful we will have in our lives. We cannot experience the full glory of God, and consequently, we cannot comprehend the full holiness of God. And my friends, as we do this together, as we do this together, we can begin to understand our purpose. We can begin to understand why we are here as a church We can begin to understand why we are here as a spiritual community. We understand that more because of what we have learned about our God. I have been on a journey. This is part of my journey of saying, God, what is it you want me to do? Because as we we go through life, there's changes. God, where can I fully serve you? Where can I fully be a follower of you? What can I do what's best for you? And what's best for my church? How can my church fully comprehend this fullness of the gospel? And I have some changes coming. As I've realized that there needs to be transitions in my life. And there needs to be transitions here at the church. As we are in this journey together. I'm going to read this to you because this is what I'm reading to all the services. So I'll make sure I'm consistent. So it's, uh, I'll try to read it with quickly. Brothers and sisters, on June 3rd, 1983, three weeks after Deb and I were married, we visited the, this church that we had heard about called Oversea Chinese Mission. Little did we know that the comment of one person would be used by God to change the direction of our lives. Over the last almost 40 years, I'm an old man, we have formed our most significant relationships and our life ministry has been intricately tied to this church. But that is how God works. He takes the most insignificant and weaves together lives and experiences to achieve his purposes in this fallen world. Every part of our married lives has been connected with this church, serving with youth ministry, administration, children's ministry, English ministry after school program, and as missionaries sent to Guatemala. OCM was our first supporting church when God moved us to Hope Bible Mission in 1996. While serving at HBM, God still used us in our home church supporting youth and English ministries at OCM and two of our branch churches. Even while living in Guatemala, God allowed me to support the ministry at OCM as interim English pastor. In OCM, I was ordained as a missions pastor. I have learned that the road God has for me is usually not what I expected. When Deb and I came back from Guatemala in 2013, to once again serve on the staff of OCM. The two years we planned to stay turned to 10 years. And we have not regretted one second of those blessed years serving here. Not one second. Deb did not leave the staff of OCM because she was tired of the ministry. 
She loves and misses the kids dearly. It was because the ministry in Guatemala needed us to return. But both of us could not fully leave our church at that time. We felt that we were still needed here. But as you know, I am getting older. And we, be, and we need to begin to think about the next generation of our church. In addition, the work in Guatemala is not done. So I've been discussing with the deacons a transition that will begin to bring in new leadership while also allowing me more time to meet the needs of the ministry in Guatemala with Deb. What exactly does this mean? It means simply that I will be spending more time with the ministry in Guatemala as an OCM missionary while serving at OCM in English and youth ministries. I will continue to lead both the English and youth ministries until we have full-time ministers in both positions. I will continue to preach twice a month in the English service. I will continue to teach CE classes. I will continue to lead small groups. I will continue to counsel couples and individuals. Much of the ministry happens virtually, and I will continue all of those roles just as I have been every time I have been in Guatemala. Deb and I are committed to supporting the overall ministry of OCM locally and globally. The deacons have begun to search for a new English ministry pastor and youth minister. They have asked me to continue until both positions are filled and to continue to advise for up to six months as an advisor after they are filled, which I agreed to do. As you can see, I will be around for a while. Maybe until I'm 70 by the time I find somebody. I will just be spending more time in Guatemala. My sharing today is a testimony to the incredible plans of our God. I believe he brought us to OCM 40 years ago, just three weeks after we were married, for a purpose beyond our understanding. I believe that God has given Deb and I opportunities to serve here at OCM in Guatemala that we could never have imagined. We have been privileged to serve with you. As we begin this journey of transition, please keep Deb and I in prayer, please. We are keeping our church in prayer. Some of you may have more questions. Please speak with me here at church or feel free to contact me. I am always available to share about the work that God is doing in our lives. And I just want to emphasize a couple things of what I just shared with you. And that is that I, we, I will be continuing. Uh, covenant small groups, Cornerstone large and small group. I can't miss my covenant small group. Or Cornerstone, excuse me, Cornerstone small group. C classes, I'll be teaching for whatever period of time. We'll continue on. I'll finish up those, do those classes and more. I have premarital couples that I'm meeting with, personal counseling. You can reach me as you need to reach me. This afternoon, Cornerstone, I forgot to mention Cornerstone. We're meeting this afternoon, 2 o'clock. But we're going to end by before 3.30 because I want to go see the finals of JFF. Okay. So we're going to do that this afternoon. I'm still here until God brings in the people that he needs, that we need here. Because I believe that God has the plan. And the, if we follow his journey for us, we will glorify him. And I believe that I will glorify him as I follow the journey that God has before me. And you as well. We get to do this together. We need to do this together. I appreciate your prayers. I'm going to show you a video. I might go a little bit over time today. Um, of what God is doing in Guatemala so you can pray for Deb and I in this journey as we continue to serve together. And I'm gonna, I have to go up to the Cantonese service. I'm not trying to avoid you, uh, but I have to go up and share this in the Cantonese service in a few moments, but I'll come down later and we'll chat um, as we have those opportunities. We deeply love and care for our church. Gordon, can you show our video, please? Hello, friends. We are Rick and Deb Carey and direct the work of Hope Bible Mission. Hope Bible Mission is an evangelical, nonprofit ministry working in partnership with local leaders and churches in the Quiche region of Guatemala. We build long-term partnerships with local churches and ministries by training leaders in developing culturally appropriate programs that share the gospel of Christ. We have three ministry paths biblical training of rural pastors and leaders, a Run Hope education initiative that helps teachers and students persevere and complete their education, our aviation partner ministry, Agape, that seeks to provide access to remote areas to edify the church. We have a wonderful growing national team of Bible teachers, pilots, 
administrative support, and of course, lots of kids. We are thankful that all ministry areas are once again moving ahead after some challenging pandemic years. We started our new year in Guatemala by gathering our team and their families to celebrate King's Day, the day set aside to remember the wise men who searched for the Christ child and brought gifts to honor him as the long-awaited king. It was a great time of gathering in the garden of our offices to give thanks to God for the gift of Jesus, to enjoy a time of good food, crazy games, and to exchange gifts. Mission work can be challenging and stretching, but we also believe the strength of our team lies in enjoying and celebrating God's goodness together. Exploring geography was the theme of our conference as we brought 25 of our Run Hope teachers to Guatemala City. We had various workshops as we visited the amazing relief map in Guatemala City, hiked the active volcano Pacaya, and learned about the past Mayan civilization in Museo Miraflores, built right in the heart of a large shopping area in Guatemala City. We used Psalm 104 as our reflection devotion passage, and as we talked about the geographic landforms, natural resources, and the eco-regional diversity in Guatemala. Here is a short drone clip that shows you a bit of Guatemala's amazing geography and our brave teachers who hiked the active volcano Pacaya. On the last night of the conference, we asked each school to share a song. We were touched when the teachers of Light and Life School chose to sing How Great Thou Art in a shield, their mother tongue, as a response to all they had experienced during the conference. Here's a little taste of the music that evening under the stars. Bible training programs for pastors and leaders are once again taking place in three different areas in Quiche, with 62 pastors and leaders enrolled. We are so very thankful for your prayers and support that keep the work in Guatemala going. Please pray specifically for an upcoming training in Salquio Grande at Colegio Lucy Vida for our Firm Foundations Bible program and the introduction of an English language curriculum. The students learn in Ishil and in Spanish, and now they want to add English to their program. Pray for safety and security for our Bible teachers that regularly travel to remote communities. The previous rainy season was very strong, and the roads continue to have problems. Pray for two new pilots that are here for training with Agape, our partner aviation ministry that seeks to provide access to remote areas of Guatemala to edify the local church. Pray for continued good training and excellent maintenance skills to assure the safety of flights. Please lift up the planning for community race days in May for our three Run Hope schools that have 260 students. These events help build motivation for continuing education and provide an opportunity to share with the community the eternal hope that is the goal of every part of Hope's work in Guatemala. Hermanos y hermanas, que Dios los bendiga. Muchísimas gracias por el apoyo que están brindando a los programas de educación bíblica aquí en Guatemala. Su apoyo y sus oraciones son muy importantes para nosotros. Muchísimas gracias. Que Dios los bendiga. Can we rise as we respond in song? Thank you. 
bows before the Lamb of God and sing. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all kings, and to you are all things. You deserve the Heavenly Father, we pray that you would show us your ways. Help us to know you. Help us to experience you so that our lives can be a reflection of your glory. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy
go in peace and have a good week and exit to you.